Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of All Access. It's been an illustrious week, and uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a fun discussion today. There's so much to discuss. So let me uh, share my screen with you so, uh, so I have my notes with me. Um, well, uh, there's so many things to discuss and so many exciting events. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if my sharing is actually working. I'm hoping it is. Um, Okay, so uh, uh, so the very first thing that I think we should talk a little bit about was a huge surprise that came out yesterday. I woke up at 7 a.m. to find out that a character from the past, a character from a past that um, I had nothing to do with, that where we were a bystander and watched, uh, watched in awe and amazement back when Quadriga was exploding, just suddenly reappeared in our lives. Uh, just to recap, the Quadriga story is quite illustrious. This is the story of an exchange in Canada, um, an exchange started by a man called Jerry Cotton from Nova Scotia with a um, partner called Omar Danani. And, uh, and it turns out that Quadriga uh, collapsed with about $150 million worth of cu customer funds uh, missing. And uh, once that happened, there were all sorts of questions. Everything about this whole operation was shady. and. In a typical crypto fashion, the more you looked, that was like it was fractal frauds. Inside a fraud, there was another fraud. Inside that fraud, there was another one. I'll just give you the, the highlights of Quadriga, at least as far as I can understand them. These are all alleged situations. But um, uh, first of all, the uh, the founder, one of the co-founders of Quadriga, Jerry, went missing. Uh, or didn't go missing. Went went to uh, went on honeymoon to India, and uh, while on honeymoon to India. <laughs> He uh, got uh, uh, Crohn's disease, a bout of Crohn's disease, and died overnight. That in itself is kind of unusual. That's a very chronic disease. People don't typically die overnight from this thing. And uh, there are all sorts of questions about uh, his, his, his newlywed wife, uh, her past, and, uh, and, uh, and the, so the disposition of her past husbands. Uh, there's all sorts of questions about whether or not he really died. Uh, there's all sorts of questions about how he died and uh, what happened to the body, who, who did the autopsy, etc. All of that is in the hands of the Canadian police right now, uh, getting looked into. The uh, funds that had been stored on Quadriga just went disappearing. They, they had disappeared prior to that trip to India. Uh, and as I said, there's all, all fractal frauds. These people had, um, had done some charity work in India, but the charity that took the money uh, was also a questionable one. It wasn't actually building orphanages as you paid money. They had one orphanage where they were recycling the, the orphanage itself, just changing the sign. You know, every time a Westerner uh, donates some money to this orphanage, it's the same same orphanage, the sign gets changed, and they get to believe that they, they built a new one. That's at least one of the allegations. And, uh, and it's just so many complicated things. But one thing that's not so complicated about this whole story is, is his co-founder, Omar Danani, had a very checkered past. He'd been declared persona non grata in the U.S., had been deported from the U.S., and uh, was living in Canada. And so this, this person had a 20-year history of fraud. And uh, to hear that Wonderland's treasury had been entrusted to him, that he was the CFO of a treasury, was just such a shock. And, and to hear that this was being pitched as a second chance just came as an enormous, enormous surprise and a huge letdown to, to many of us. Um, we are not in this space, and I did certainly did not leave my uh, my uh, uh, my tenured position at Cornell in order to work with situations, like, you know, to get into situations like this, where where there are people in my periphery uh, who who have histories like this. So we all have to police ourselves as a space. And if we don't police ourselves, then the regulators will come in with all sorts of, all sorts of uh, onerous rules uh, and police ourselves, police us for, for us. And that's exactly what we don't want to have happen. So, um, uh, so I think this is a huge letdown. And so that's sort of my first gut reaction is, is just this should not be happening. There's just no no explanation for this there's no second chances for a you know for somebody who's already had 11 chances um so uh this is just it's just insane it's crazy um i'm glad to see that the right things are happening and the right things are removal of this individual from this position of trust um 
My second reaction is we should not be engaging in contracts where somebody is in, in command of a treasury like this. We got into DeFi. We got excited about this area because it is decentralized. Those decisions should not be in anybody's hands. This should be all DAOs all the way down. And not DAOs in name only, but true DAOs. So that's the second big, uh, big event. And I think we're going to see that tested. We're going to see if this thing is really a DAO, if it's really acting in accordance with users' wishes, and whether it's able to cut people out of critical decision-making processes, cut human trust out. That's why we got into this space. We got into this space to build technology that eliminates trust, that eliminates the human element. So uh, those are the, the big, big outcomes from this. The third thing that's been a big bit of a pain uh, in my side has been the way this has been reported in media. So uh, the block made a big mistake in its initial reporting. They have since corrected it to their credit. They call this an avalanche based project. Um, it's not, it just happens to be deployed on avalanche as well as other chains. It's deployed on Ethereum, it's deployed on uh, Phantom, it's deployed on, on Arbitrum, it's deployed on multiple chains. So, um, so that's, uh, there is no excuse for that kind of reporting. And if you're a reporter covering this, or if you know of reporters covering this, then uh, and or you see reporting of this kind that you know to be incorrect, please uh, send the messages along with me uh, to say, hey, you got to co correct this. This is this is uh, uh, this is not a good association. So we certainly had nothing to do whatsoever with Wonderland. So uh, so I think that's uh, that's where we are. And uh, I'm really hopeful that the community will do what's what's right. And I am I am slightly elated by the response. Everybody immediately recognized that this was a problem, and uh, we got to do better vetting of anonymous founders as a space. There are there are quite a few. The regulatory it's a catch. It's a, it's a funny catch, right? It's the, the catch is uh, for a bunch of reasons that that relate to unclarity in regulations. People choose to be anonymous. And once they're anonymous, then the usual vetting processes cannot work. So, so we are stuck as a space, and uh, we would greatly benefit from uh, clear clarity of regulation. And uh, in the meantime, we have to do everything that we can to uh, weed out shady characters. So that's all I'm going to say about this. There's nothing much else to say about it. Um, it's, uh, it's entirely in the hands of the Wonderland community from here on out, and I hope that they will eliminate these bad actors. And so as a space, uh, we, we don't get tainted. Okay, on to happier news. Yesterday saw 1.1 million transactions, partly because of the Wonderland drama. So, uh, so there's suddenly the drama quotient in our space went from whatever it was to something off scale high. Uh, there was lots and lots of worries about Wonderland and uh, that created a lot of stress for the underlying chains. So now as a, as a technologist, of course, this is interesting and it, it uh, ends up putting quite a lot of stress on the underlying systems. Uh, Avalanche ended up handling 96% of Ethereum's load yesterday. And while doing so, a swap operation on Avalanche was less than a quarter dollars, was, was, less, than 20, was less than 25 cents, 23 cents to be precise. Meanwhile, the same operation was 61.94 or something, 62 dollars on Ethereum. So uh, this is what it is. And uh, when I say this, of course, this triggers quite a lot of people. And uh, and so uh, I'll get back to that. Um, it's uh, it's kind of a funny uh, funny situation to be in. Uh, if you're an ETH, ETH maxi, uh, why is it funny? Well, because you have to simultaneously believe a whole lot of things that that ETH is just fine, that ETH two will arrive in the future that will save Ethereum. And at the same time, some other huge problem will arrive for other chains that such that 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 boogeyman is going to kill them all off. So uh, so we start seeing that that dynamic in action. So there's something called state bloat and state bloat is around the corner. And uh, and uh, ETH2 is also around the corner, which that corner, it's been around that corner since 2016. Um, so it's around that corner again. Uh, and uh, and so ETH2 will come in as a savior and the boogeyman is the boogeyman is going to come and eat us all. So um, the reply guys have been quite active in my in my responses. And, uh, and uh, you know, I think Kevin Sekniki put it really well. God grant me the confidence of a reply guy. Um, they're just, uh, it's amazing. They, they lecture to you as if they, uh, uh, they, they know stuff. And um, I always assume, and this is my problem, I think. It's, it's, I've been, a, I, I had been a, 
a professor for far too long and I, I work with young people, my default assumption is I'm dealing with a smart person with good intentions. I don't intend to ever change that. So I don't, this is not gonna change. I will always treat people nicely. I will always grant them some initial, initial uh, uh, period of where I assume they're good, smart people. But I found myself in some of these discussions and there's some guy that, you know, he tweets at you 12 times and then he says, you know, something like uh, time to finality on uh, Ethereum is, is 15 seconds. I don't know what to make of this. At that point, you just feel like, okay, I'm so sorry I even responded. Um, that's, that's block time. It's not time to finality. Everybody should know this. If you don't know this, then I don't think you should be lecturing me about how to scale blockchains. It's like uh, we are, it's just, it's, we're, we're, we're of two different worlds. I think most of you who listen to this podcast know the difference between block times and time to finality. Block times is when you produce the blocks. Time to finality is when they become immortalized on the chain. I can, you know, Bitcoin produces blocks every 10 minutes, but it's only after six confirmations that they become immortalized, that they become immutable. So I thought everybody knew this, that everybody who's at least, you know, going to go and engage with the, with the researcher in this space should know this. So it's really funny, um, but this is what it is. We did this. Uh, hopefully we'll be handling more of Ethereum's load and, uh, and rest assured that this boogeyman, he, I'm not saying the boogeyman does not exist. I'm not saying, it's just, just as with everything, there's, there has to be a grain of truth to, uh, to fears, uncertainty, and doubt. Because otherwise then it's just, it's just made up you know, kids' tales and everyone can tell. So there has to be a grain of truth. There is such a thing as state bloat. Lots and lots of state can be problematic. That is true. Many other things can be problematic. That is also true. They picked on that one. And uh, yeah, so um, in terms of blocks, uh, this is just a, a milestone for us. We reached the 10 million uh, milestone. That's a lot of blocks produced. Uh, Ethereum has 14 million uh, blocks. Now, obviously, the block contents matter, and they're different contents. But Avalanche, the chain, is actually doing quite a lot of useful things. We have more than 500 deployed dApps. Uh, they're quite diverse. They're doing all sorts of exciting things. We've got NFTs, we've got NFT pools, we've got DeFi, we've got all sorts of lending applications, yield app farming, etc. cetera. Uh, we've got uh, play to earn games. There's like the whole gamut there. So I'm um, not suggesting that these are comparable. I'm just mentioning that they are interesting landmarks. So when we hit these milestones, I'll be mentioning them again. And uh, they also see them as a litmus test. They, these, these things trigger people who, are, who have insecurities. So... Uh, um, I think this is just what it is. Um, so uh, so it's, uh, it's really great to be producing so many blocks. It's great to be a chain that has so much value that people interact with so much. And uh, it's great to be doing this in good shape. Uh, we don't always have low fees. We can't, no chain can. We have the right dynamics such that even during that moment of very heavy load, our fees uh, did, did go up but the chain remained operational and stayed up. Compare that with chains that go down on a weekly basis, this is night and day. So uh, let's see, in terms of, uh, oh yeah, this is, this is discussing exactly that issue. This is from, uh, from essentially a couple of days ago when uh, load was very high. And uh, we ended up uh, having, um, you know, we, we ended up being the chain that had uh, high capacity and uh, absolutely no problems. Ethereum was also in this in this camp. Ethereum is a is a time tested uh, system. It uses a much more conservative by now, much well understood uh, protocol based on proof of work. So uh, it's really great to be up in that in that league. Um, and there will be a lot of other chains that, on a good day, they will provide. Uh, uh, they will provide uh, very low fees, but you know, on a, on a bad day, they will cease to function. So I don't think that such chains are good. Those people who are building those things should know that that's not how you build a stable long, you know, system with longevity. So um, they should know better than to create those kinds of dynamics. And uh, if you're a user of such a system, it's going to be very enticing on a good day because the fees are incredibly low, but then you can get DDoSed and the system stops working or you can get into a situation where the prices move and therefore there has to be a lot of chain activity and the system stop, starts to randomly uh, drop, uh, starts to randomly drop messages in, on transactions, including your own, and suddenly you get liquidated and everything you, you worked hard to build is lost. So that's an issue. 
But most of all, the thing that really gives me, uh, you know, gets me excited uh, is, is our comments like this. And uh, this is uh, from the Joe folks saying that, look, people who use this thing, they keep talking about the reliability of this system and the user experience of the dApps. I kept saying this, everybody, until we came along, everybody in this game, everybody, all of you, look, I know you, some of you follow these people and, and, and you know, these, these influencers. Um, not, not maybe YouTube influencers, but crypto Twitter influencers. I know they talk gibberish at you, okay? They, they pester you, they, they, they sort of rain down on you with all these technical terms, okay? You've heard it in the verifiable delay functions, verifiable random, this, that, and that, and there's a bunch of like, you know, Schnorr signatures and so forth being thrown at you. At the, and, but all of that, that, all of that crowd, the entirety of that crowd, until recently did not have the most basic stuff down. They did not know how to measure speed. They couldn't tell you the difference between capacity and speed. So what users care about is that speed of interaction. They click and they want that thing to take place on the blockchain as quickly as possible. That's not the same thing as TPS. Speed is not measured in transactions per second. High transactions per second does not imply high, uh, high speed. And uh, I ended up doing a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of podcasts on this before, and maybe tweet threads and so forth. So if you want to to read up on it, there's some even reading material. But the bottom line is, these people did not have the clarity of vision, and yet here they are. They're supposed to architect for you fast systems, and they couldn't. So that's why we had to come in, and that's why the innovation we brought is exactly on target. Behind that incredible user experience lies a couple of things. One, the vision to be able to say the target, target metric that everybody is going after is the wrong one. The right one is time to finality. Two, how do we get time to finality without compromising decentralization? In fact, while increasing decentralization? Well, that's the big innovative part. That's where the avalanche consensus protocol comes in. And then the third part is this whole process of communication. And I think on that front, you know, we are probably not as good as we could be. That's why I started doing these podcasts to attune everybody to really what's going on behind the scenes. Because if otherwise I leave the, you know, if, if we leave it alone, the space will just develop its own, its own narratives. And it's just going to be like, you know, uh, made up terms like weak subjectivity. It's going to be, you know, all this like TPS crap where like everybody's making up TPS numbers. And, uh, and there will be no distinguishing anything from each other. At the end of it all, though, there is a very simple metric that no one can fake and anybody can measure, and it's user satisfaction. I urge you to go and, and play with the Avalanche blockchain. It's so easy. It's so fast. And once you do it for like two days, you'll be unable to go to other systems because it's so easy and fast. And if you're worried about decentralization, this is the thing that Maximus will bring up. Oh, my decentralization. And uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, I, I digress, but I guess this podcast is all about these digressions. Um, so I digress, but um, it's, uh, it's like we, we make fun of this internally at Ava Labs, or the, the team just makes fun of it. Every single person who's worried about decentralization has no idea how to measure it. So it's like, where is this decentralization? Is it in the room with you? Like, why are you worried about it? How are you measuring it? So I would like to share your worry. Like if you're going to call my system centralized, sure, perhaps in some way it might be, let's measure it. And, uh, and then suddenly they disappear. So they realize, hey, you know, these proof of work chains that I'm pushing uh, are, are far more decentralized. And in fact, some of these proof of work chains are being run at their full capacity. I'm going to discuss this again uh, at a later time. But if you look at, uh, at, uh, at uh, chains with very, very low block times, chains that are producing blocks very frequently and using proof of work, like Ethereum, every 15 seconds, they actually encourage large mining pools. Because if you found the block, then you have an advantage. Everybody else hasn't found your block. They have to wait for it. They have to wait for it to percolate through the network. They have to get it. And that's a, that's a costly, it takes time for that percolation to happen. So, um, so that's why if you're running your network, you can't just run a proof of work network faster and faster. And, uh, and in fact, even at the, at the rates that it's running uh, right now, the, uh, there, is a, there is a clear measurable advantage to larger pools. 
And uh, I can talk about the study that we did to, uh, to identify this. And I can show you graphically exactly how to identify it. Uh, we used its uh, first of its kind measurement technique to, uh, to discover this advantage and to even measure the, uh, uh, the, uh, the average distance between miners. So it was an interesting study from a couple years back. So, uh, so yeah, these central, the centralization fears and so forth, they're just, it's just parroted narratives. ETH maxis heard it for years from the Bitcoin maxis. And it was unfair coming from Bitcoin to ETH. And now it's unfair coming from the ETH maxis to anybody else. Okay, it just has to stop. There's no scientific basis to it. And uh, we just have to calmly, uh, calmly and quietly deal with it. And at times it's going to be hard because trolls are trolls and maxis are maxis. And, you know, the maxi techniques are always the same. One thing that's, that we should keep in mind is maximalism is what, is what does it do. So when you see the hockey stick of maximalism, that's when you know that that community is technically at an end. They ran out of every other technical option to address concerns, and now they're resorting to maximalism. They have stagnated. So that's what I saw with Bitcoin, and I stopped doing research on Bitcoin. All, my, all the students that I know also did the same thing. They know where to put their efforts, and I'm seeing the exact same thing. The, uh, the roadmaps are changing, the goalposts are moving, and, uh, and the narrative is, is negative on everything that's perceived as a threat. And, uh, and I can talk about that perception as well. It's really funny that the actual threats, they're going under the radar. And, uh, and the actual innovators in the space who are friendly uh, are seen as a threat for some reason. It's an interesting universe. All right, let's talk about other things, threats to the space. Uh, the, so this was an interesting development and one that caught me by surprise. This is uh, Zuckerberg scuttling the Diem Libra ship. Remember how many months ago, maybe about a year and a half ago, maybe more, maybe two years ago, uh, Facebook announced that they were going to do their own currency. And then they proceeded to do everything wrong, just about every single thing from the technical decisions to the, to the positioning and so on. And today, um, I think they're in a position where they're selling off the assets of uh, Diem. And I think um, uh, Silvergate Bank is buying it all for about $200 million. At the heart of it all, I think, is there's a wallet. That's kind of nice, I guess, because many, many, many engineers were working on it, like about 70 engineers worked on this thing. And uh, there is also a groundbreaking, very interesting uh, consensus protocol, uh, where the first author of that uh, uh, of that consensus protocol is Ted Yin, to dominant on Twitter. Uh, Ted Yin is my PhD student. He's Dr. Ted Yin now, and uh, and uh, and Ted's uh, Ted's one of the things Ted did when he was working with me was to go to to Silicon Valley for um, uh, a, a summer. And during that summer, he worked on this protocol with a uh, with colleagues from uh, uh, VMware and. Um, they ended up uh, coming up with what I think is the fastest, best consensus protocol in the classical domain. So this protocol is better than anything you could imagine that you know. It's better than Solana. It's better than ETH2, whatever that might, you know, however that might shape up in the future. Um, it's better than all of those signature accrual algorithms. And uh, it's better than Tendermint. It's just a very good protocol um, along many axes. But as good as it was, that protocol also did not scale. At the heart of it all, it's, uh, there's a whole bunch of communication that has to happen. And um, Facebook, for example, when they were deploying their system, they targeted about 100 to at most 200 participants. They were not going to ever have more than 200 block producers. Why? Because the technology isn't there. And if you look at all these signature accrual processes, they also suffer from similar effects. So um, it is what it is. Um, collecting all that information, uh, you know, maybe you don't have to collect all that, all that, all that many packets, but you have to collect all that much information. It's um, it's costly, and the more you have, the less it scales. So it just can't scale. And were we ever going to replace Wall Street? Were we ever going to replace our financial infrastructure? with Zuckerberg and 99 of his best friends. No, that's a non-starter. And, uh, and I, I think I said this, yeah, I did say this. So Libra Diem did everything wrong, right? So we're not gonna replace the financial system with Zuck and his friends, his best you know, friends forever. 
And the second thing they did, they decided to use their, their, their monopoly in one area to bootstrap money and to become a de facto monopoly in another area. It turns out legally you can be a monopoly. If you're successful at what you do, it's perfectly, perfectly legitimate to be essentially the de facto owner of a space. So you worked really hard at making the world's tastiest, I don't know what, pieces of bread, and you have the bread monopoly in New York, that's perfectly fine. But if you use that monopoly to also establish a monopoly in something else, cheese, for example, then that's illegal. If you start making, you know, selling cheese for very cheap to keep out competitors, bundle it with your, with your bread, et cetera, that is not cool. And uh, that was about to happen, and it gave uh, the lawmakers great, great uh, reason to pause. And uh, the state, of course, likes its own monopoly on money, and they didn't want another mega corporation coming in and inventing some kind of a uh, cross cross globe uh, money. So in the end, it was a power play. It was coupled with this culture of unilateral power grab. Remember how Facebook would just say, hey, we changed uh, your privacy settings for you and everything would revert. And every two months we had to, we had to click a whole bunch of boxes and say, no, 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 I actually want, I actually want to take care about my privacy. I, I don't want you just collecting information on me. So that same culture was at play. It was very clearly at play. And it was, it spelled the end of Libra Diem. But the bottom line is, is that decentralization matters. We're in this business because it's decentralized. It's the entire reason we're here. And, um, and if you can't build decentralized systems, or if your goal is not to build decentralized systems, then you don't belong here. Just don't, it's not the space for you. And uh, that's why there are chains out there that people just don't, don't take seriously. They're at their core, completely centralized. So uh, let's see, oh yeah, and I should mention this. There are also, also certain systems or classes of systems that again at their core, they're centralized. L2s are among them. Very few of the L2s are actually decentralized. Almost every single L2 out there, I believe every single L2 except for one, and definitely all of the L2s whose names you've heard of are actually centralized. They have a single point of failure. And many of them actually fail on a routine basis. Like on any given week, you know, they're actually having at least one outage. So um, uh, such systems are prone for all kinds of abuse. That person who operates the chain, it's like Joe's execution shop. He's in a position, Joe there, he's in a position to collect all your monies. How? He's going to front run you. you know, so what did you do? You ended up replacing the current system with a whole complicated series of uh, layers of software filled with all kinds of fancy words and fancy concepts and so forth. And if you combine it all, what did you do? Congratulations, you reinvented the system as we have it. You reinvented Citadel, you reinvented people who jump in front of retail flow. So that's not what we're about. I'm dedicated to getting rid of all intermediaries and L2s are intermediaries. So when you make your bets about the future, be careful because you could be betting on a centralization uh, on centralization just as a core tenet uh, and your, your future plans for how to build these systems might very well uh, again, funnel value and users into the hands of a couple of players. Okay, so uh, let's see. Okay, so this is towards the end. Um, I think uh, one of the uh, the interesting uh, or one of the quick perennial questions we get is, what's the roadmap? What are you going to do? Da, da, da. I'm not just by nature. I'm not a person who likes to talk about future plans all that much. I like doing things. So I'm not going to come up here on this podcast and talk to you about, you know, the VDFs and et cetera, and how we're going to run a hardware challenge for VDFs and da, 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 da. That's not going to happen. That's not who we are. We measure ourselves by what we build. So I have a team that, you know, that works with me. We're going to build things. If you have ideas for how to build other things, that's wonderful. We'll work with you. And, um, uh, and we judge you by what you put out, not by the noise you make on, on crypto Twitter or wherever else on social media, but by what you actually do. So instead of a detailed roadmap of we're going to do X, then Y, then Z. And in fact, I've gotten this criticism. I've been told, hey, every other team is putting out all this gibberish. You're not. So you're, there's a de deficit. You got to be you gotta bringing in your, your, you know, your distributed systems knowledge. You got to be actually sharing with us all these details and so forth. I could, 
but it's just fundamentally not who I am. Okay, I will go delve into certain topics when when the time is right. Um, we do delve into them in depth. I try never to actually use uh, fancy terminology, and I always try to make it accessible to everyone. And we're going to continue that. Um, what I do want to share with you are our goals. These are the things that matter. And my goal for this year, we're at the beginning of it, barely uh, just a few weeks in, is that Avalanche should have the highest TVL in this space. And we're going to do this not by carving it out of other chains, but by growing the space. There is, there's trillions of value out there. I've said this many times. We're one of the few chains to invent new asset types, to grow the space. We're not here to go and cannibalize and, and whatever else, other chains. That's the job of L2s. They're, they're all on there. They're going to compete among each other. It's going to be quite a sight. Um, but uh, we are here to actually bring new assets in. That's one of the things that we did. We invented ILOs, and we have many other assets of this kind. We're going to start with alternative assets, where there is no competition from incumbents, from the traditional finance people. Then we're going to go on, I think, with the help of partners uh, into into uh, the TradFi space. Um, and it's going to be a, a glorious run where we go from, I think it's around 1 trillion today to hundreds of trillions of value on blockchains. That's our goal. Uh, we want to have the highest daily active users in the space. We are already well on our way. Uh, I think I'm really proud of the, the daily activity on Avalanche and how reliably we've handled it. We would love to see more of you. We would love, love to make the experience even nicer than it is. It's pretty good now. You will be hooked after you use Avalanche for, for a few times. You'll, you'll immediately get the hang of a fast blockchain and it becomes really hard to go elsewhere. But there is much more to do uh, to make that experience even better and we're actively working on it. And uh, one of the things we're building is a new wallet. Um, I'm really excited about this wallet that we're creating and uh, can't wait for it to become public and we're going to work uh, with the user community to, uh, to improve upon it. Um, another thing that I want to do is to surpass the 1 million mark with, uh, with Avalanche um, in terms of uh, transactions per second. Um, Avalanche's transactions per second is unlimited. Let me say that again. The number of t transactions that we can handle per second is infinity. Why? Because we have subnets. We can, at the same time, uh, pursue parallel executions. This is something that I know that other chains are having difficulty implementing. We already did it. And one of the, these things just got deployed, uh, I think last week, I mentioned it, Spaces VM, it's its own subnet. Um, just yesterday, um, one of my engineers um, deployed Wagme, which is a different VM that does its own thing, uh, again, in a different subnet. And don't, don't forget that there are three subnets already within Avalanche. Most people know the C chain, the contract chain, but there's also the X chain and the platform chain, the P chain. The, the ultimate number of these subnets is infinity. So this is a system built from the ground up for growth. And it's going to be a glorious period of growth up ahead of us as uh, regular financial uh, professionals realize the, the power of, uh, of blockchains and start to look for alternatives or platforms that can handle their loads. And finally, um, there is going to be a, a new subnet powered Web3 economy, especially in a, in a bear market. It's the time to build these things. Um, so this is the uh, essentially what we're going to see is the emergence of a new economy based not on ads, not on surveillance, not on tracking users, but uh, instead by flipping the, the book, by having the users be in command of their data, by having the applications uh, provide, and, uh, provide their services, in a manner where the user is always in control. And that, that Web3 economy does require additional features not found and not, not, not uh, realizable in current smart contract platforms. They're going to need their own VMs. And uh, those VMs then therefore require their own systems, in our case, their own subnets. So we have the capacity to, to, uh, to uh, embody them um, by using unique custom subnets. So I'm really excited about this, and uh, this is our goal. This is where the sites are at. We will do whatever it takes to get there. So I'm not going to you know, paint a pretty story for you with a whole bunch of dazzling technical keywords. We know them all. 
we are the most uh, decorated team and uh, you know academically credentialed team and none of it matters i'll be the very first person to say that those credentials don't matter and um, you know i see these other teams they 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 want to be academics they act like academics they're like pseudo academics and, uh, and they throw all these words at the the common public and i think it's just a big big folly don't fall for it um, as somebody who could be doing that uh, we choose not to actively not to do that that's not the, the the right approach. We need to build systems that work. We need to build systems that are understandable, and we need to build systems that are a delight to use. So, on that front, I'm really excited about what's to come. And uh, this is here. You know, this is where we are uh, today. In uh, on, I guess the third, third or fourth week of January, and uh, I'm looking forward to a glorious year. Uh, there's going to be ups and downs. It's been clear from the Fed that. Uh, that the macro conditions will vary over time and um, you know the markets will go will do whatever markets do none of that matters we got to have the, the the long game imagine where we were multiple years ago we've come such a long way it's things that used to be discarded or looked down upon this entire space um, that was ignored for so many years just today was declared an area of of national importance as a professor, I tried to get the attention of other fellow academics, and, uh, and I tried to outline how this was indeed an issue of national importance, that blockchains were so important. And people did not quite listen. Uh, various funding agencies did not listen. And, uh, and here we are, uh, suddenly from the White House down, uh, people are suddenly saying, oh, you know, the cryptocurrency area is an area of national strategic importance. It's, uh, it's fascinating. So, um, so we stand poised at the, at the edge of enormous growth uh, in the long term or in the medium term. And in the very short term, it's going to be, it might be ups and downs and ups and downs. But the amount of value waiting on the sidelines, you know, ready to pound in and uh, grow the space is immense. And, uh, and I think we as a community uh, stand uh, poised very well uh, to take advantage of that. So thank you for your time. And I'm looking forward to the, the next week, weeks to come.